Well, unlike Senator Booker, I don't think many Americans would be surprised or shocked that the 13th Amendment allows prison labor. It's been there from the very beginning. It's just as much a part of our Constitution as is any other provision. I do suspect, though, at this hearing, we're going to hear more from Democratic senators and their witnesses unfairly attacking our prison systems and the outstanding men and women who serve in them. They might even compare prison work programs to slavery. This is a vicious and ugly smear against the very skilled, brave men and women who work and serve in our prisons as law enforcement and correctional officers. Such talk may be fashionable in faculty lounges and Washington, D.C. cocktail parties, but it's wholly divorced from the reality on the ground in our prisons. Prisons are dangerous places full of dangerous people. Given nothing to occupy their time, prisoners will usually regress back to doing what they were sent to prison for in the first place. Idle hands are the devil's workshop. Reducing idle time has always been a key policy objective for prison labor programs. Almost 100 years ago, this very committee held hearings on prison labor, just like this one. The committee issued a report finding that prison work programs help maintain order inside prisons. This committee said, quote, or this committee, quote, unanimously conceded that idleness in prisons breeds disorder and aggravates criminal tendencies, and concluded that prison work prevents prison violence by replacing idle time with productive activity. But it's not just about filling otherwise idle time. This committee's 1930 report also found that prison jobs help prepare inmates for life on the outside by teaching them, quote, habits of industry. Our prison work programs have come a long way since 1930. Today, many prisons partner with technical college that gives inmates the opportunity to receive job skill certificates. Many offer pre-apprenticeship opportunities as well. Some programs even allow inmates to work for private employers at market wages, giving them the opportunity to pay off victim restitution, meet child support obligations, and save money for life after prison. Contrary to what we'll probably hear today, there's nothing illegal or unconstitutional about prison labor, even for little or no pay, nor is there anything immoral about it. Prison labor is a way for inmates to give something back to the society they wronged. American society doesn't owe criminals restitution. Criminals owe our society restitution. And if that means scrubbing toilets, mopping floors, or picking up the garbage, then so be it. In summary, prison jobs help keep the peace, teach inmates job skills and work habits, and fulfill the original objectives of prison. Most prison officials would tell our committee just that, which is why I wish we had a representative from a prison here today to speak about these programs. I had invited a respected representative of the Arkansas prison system to testify, and he had agreed, but after seeing the amended title of this hearing, which for a few days last week equated prison labor to slavery, he chose not to attend. That's very understandable on his part, but it's also unfortunate for us. If the Democrats were not interested in pursuing an ideological agenda, we might have learned something today. In any case, I look forward to hearing from our witnesses. Thank you, Senator Cotton. We will. Ms. Turner, in your opening statement, you called the so-called exception clause of the 13th Amendment a gaping loophole. Do you, you believe that is a loophole? I do. I do. It is the foundation of prison labor <clears throat> programs today, and it led to uh, the labor programs we have today that uh, we have truly have forced but labor. You, so you think a loophole implies it was unintended or accidental or remission. You think the, the people who drafted the 13th Amendment and ratified it didn't know what they were doing? Oh, I think it was absolutely intentional, and it allowed for the use of incarcerated people to replace this free slave force uh, provided by chattel slavery. And we saw it in some states, for instance, in Texas, following the passage of 13th Amendment, the state of Texas purchased 10 plantations and began running them as prisons, some of which still run today. So was, did prisons use labor before the 13th Amendment was passed? Yes. So, so it was just continuing a long-standing practice. It, it wasn't replacing anything. It expanded. It expanded. It allowed for the expansion of prison labor programs, and in fact, became so lucrative that it led to passage of laws such as the Black Codes that encouraged the re the reincarceration of black men on specious charges to continue to work in prisons and to provide uh, profit for prisons, both in the North and in the South. So, it, so, and it's your testimony that we need to have a constitutional amendment to repeal that clause. Yes, there's no place okay, for forced labor in the United States. Mr. Layman, as I already mentioned in my opening remarks, in 1930, this committee 
quote, unanimously conceded that idleness in prison breeds disorder and that prison jobs help maintain orders in prison by reducing idle time. Does modern day research back up that assertion from almost 100 years ago? Uh, in general, yes, although I think it's an under-evaluated question. The Minnesota study I cited earlier finds that there's a strong association between the fraction of time spent working and the level of misconduct uh, declining. That study cites prior research, uh, including, I believe, a study of the federal prison employment system then called Unicor, which finds that compared to matched controls, uh, people who work are less likely to engage in misconduct in prisons. And and the causal story is pretty straightforward. If you're working, it's hard to engage in misconduct. Okay. And the, the committee back then also found that prison jobs help inmates acquire, quote, the habits of industry. Is that still the case today? Yes. And I think the strongest finding in the evidence is that prison labor, even unskilled prison labor, and this goes back to the study of Italian workers, um, even unskilled prison labor increases labor force involvement, increases wages, increases earnings, following... Uh, incarceration, that to me says if it does nothing else, prison labor is a way to improve people's labor market outcomes after they leave prison. Okay. Senator Booker has a bill that would require prisons to pay inmates the same federal minimum wage that law-abiding American workers outside prison are entitled to receive. I want to explore the financial pressures that Americans face today thanks to Joe Biden's inflationary economy. Do prison inmates have to pay for rent or mortgage? Not to the best of my knowledge, Senator. They pay for grocery bills? I don't believe so, Senator. Car payments? No, no, sir. Insurance payments? No, sir. Gas to drive to work? Uh, not to the best of my knowledge. Any other daily expenses that most law-abiding American citizens have to worry about? Uh, with certain conspicuous exemptions in some states in general, no, prisoners are not responsible for okay. those. Uh, if, if prisons were forced to pay inmates those higher wages, probably a lot higher than what the current minimum wage is, given other Democratic proposals, who is ultimately going to be paying for those higher wages? Um, in contexts where they're employed by uh, the state or other public entities, the taxpayer who ultimately funds those public entities, if they're employed by indirectly by private employers, then the people who are paying for those private employers, but that makes their labor much less competitive in that context. Okay. Thank you. I yield back, Brent.